thing. I'm trying to record a podcast. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. My guest today is Wendy Shankin Cohen of Dr. Harvey's, which is one of my favorite um, food brands that I have used for uh, at least 10 years, if not four. Um, I remember discovering them so long ago and being so fascinated with this bag of beautiful freeze-dried vegetables and ingredients and loved it. My dogs loved it. And it's one of the easiest ways that I help customers that come into my store to transition from maybe a kibble diet to something where they can kind of participate and feed their dogs a whole fresh meal. Um, so we're going to talk about that. Wendy is a homeopath. She's a nutritional um, consultant. And in 1998, joined her husband, Dr. Harvey's, on creating this line of incredible dog foods that are all natural and real food for our pets. You're going to love this episode. Stay tuned. This is Ayla. She's a seven-year-old Schnauzer poodle mix, and she suffers from chronic allergies. Prior to finding Ayla's full-spectrum hemp oil, we were giving her Apoquil every day for her allergy symptoms, and that did nothing but mask her symptoms and lower her immune system. Ever since September of 2020, when Ayla had a mast cell tumor removed surgically, we've been using her full-spectrum hemp oil every night. Ayla enjoys running around in the yard. She enjoys going for walks and car rides, and her favorite thing to play with is her red ball. We are so happy we found her full-spectrum hemp oil so we can ease her allergy symptoms naturally. So I don't know if you know this, but I've been using your food since like, I want to say 2006, 2007. I used to have a magazine and I was sent a sample and I remember opening it and being like, what the heck is this stuff? And I remember it looked so pretty and I remember reading the ingredients and doing it. My dogs ate it and loved it. Um, but I now think about nowadays and how, you know, there's such a, an incredible movement with raw feeding and feeding raw and you know, the controversy of whether dogs are omnivores or carnivores. Um, I believe they're omnivores. What do you have to say about that? So I'm in agreement with you. We do believe that dogs are omnivores and that there's a great deal of benefit for them to include some vegetables. Uh, there are certain vegetables which are really important for good health and uh, help to balance out uh, to make a complete and and uh, nourishing diet. So the phytonutrients that we find in vegetables as well as vitamins and minerals are easily absorbed by dogs in their system. And mixing it in with high quality meat as well as oils uh, makes a complete meal. And we think there's no question that that it's important an, an important addition to any dog's diet. Um, I also love that you have shiitake in your recipes and in, in a lot of your supplements, you include mushrooms also. So you've been also using these amazing functional mushrooms in your recipes for all these years. Um, are you really excited now to see that people are catching up to what you guys have been preaching and making Absolutely. for all these years? Absolutely. We're thrilled. I mean, you know, it, it it's interesting to be the ones that have been standing on that soapbox and and screaming listen you have to pay attention to me i like uh, trying to picture me in 30 years will people be going cannabis is normal mushrooms are great you know what i'm saying yeah. like i hope that's what it'll be like in 30 years i so think you're, you guys are the original uh, the original gangsters the uh, ogs yes. in you are, the, you, in you the are definitely the ogs <laughs> i love it what are like when you were choosing the vegetables what are the best vegetables for our dogs to eat? So you want vegetables that, that, that uh, break down easily, and you want uh, vegetables that are really chock full of all the vitamins that dogs need. So we love green beans. We love broccoli. Uh, we love broccoli for all the phytonutrients that it provides and think that it's preventative against cancer and other diseases. Yes, it uh, is. We do like... <laughs> Um, we like celery. We like uh, squash. We love pumpkin for all of its wonderful uh, things that it can can give, as well as the digestive uh, ability that it has to help dogs. Uh, 
So the, a wide variety. There are very few vegetables that you can't include with the dogs in a dog's diet. Um, there are certain things like raw tomatoes, and you wouldn't want to give raw onions. Um, but for example, one of the great myths is about about garlic, which uh, you know is one of those believies. We call them believies when. Uh, the community gets hooked on an idea, and then it becomes. Yeah, it goes on. Yeah, it goes with lavender essential oil and THC and all these other things that they say that will kill dogs. Exactly, exactly. And you know, for years we have put garlic in our supplements because it's antiviral, antibacterial, and antifungal, and just generally great. And this rumor that you know, garlic is poisonous to dogs just took off and. Once it's out there on the internet, it's very, very hard to to fight it. But of course, garlic is great for dogs in small amounts and very, very healthful and protective in many ways against many diseases. So um, we try to fight against those believies as as well as the grain free yes grain argument and DCM. And of course, I'm a huge uh, a researcher when it comes to DCM, as I have a uh, Doberman Pinscher, and so did I. Yes, I know, <laughs> I know, I'm thrilled. Um, and he's super, super healthy. But we are very conscious about heart health. And you know, this whole thing that came out that was written that uh, grain-free dog foods would cause DCM. You know, it has stuck, and it's still there, and it's still you hear it all the time. Uh, on the internet. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And you're constantly trying to fix it. And then you're like, oh my gosh. And now I'm the crazy person going, that's not the right information. Yeah. I know yeah. It, it is terrible. Um, And people have no idea that are outside. I think most of my listeners know the truth and don't have to worry about that. But yes, a grain-free diet does not cause DCM. And it's really funny. I like that you brought up um, your Doberman because same I was doing everything to make sure that I, you know, protected her heart and fed her what she needed so that I didn't lose her to that. And then what happened? I lost her to the other thing that we have to worry about with our large breed dogs, which is osteosarcoma um, and why I swore by your food when she was sick, because it's uh, your paradigm is actually ketogenic because I don't think people understand that vegetables can be ketogenic. Vegetables can also have cooling and hot properties to them. So all of that makes a difference. So A, thank you for making a food that I could trust and feed my sick dog and that she was able to thrive on. Um, I also love it because you're one of the originals when it comes to using mushrooms and, you know, your supplements. Um, I see shiitake that you use the most. What do you love the most about shiitake? Because it's my favorite as far <laughs> as food. Um and uh, I just love it. So when did you start discovering the benefits of these functional mushrooms and started to use them? We've actually been using mushrooms both for humans and for uh, dogs for probably 30 years. You know, love we it. really have been involved in um, the healing properties of all mushrooms. Love shiitake, love rishi, love maitake, um, have been talking about it for, for years and once they became available in a dehydrated form, we were able to add them into the foods and find that they're extremely important in a preventative and treatment program for any dog. Absolutely. I'm going through a, a certification course right now with Lee Carroll, and he says we need to be having three grams three times a week that they're so packed full of so many antioxidants and vitamins and minerals and nutrients and all these things that we are constantly trying to supplement and it's all in these amazing functional um, mushrooms. So I love that you've been using them for this whole time. Yeah. Uh, well, Dr. Harvey is an herbalist and um, I also have studied herbs uh, along with my homeopathy and um, we consider the mushrooms to be part of that world Yep, and have found, uh, you know, really there's not anything quite as powerful as mushrooms. I know. They're, and they're in a whole class um, to themselves. And then what I love is that the research that's now coming back, and I always like to say that the herbs and the fungi that work best together are these adaptogens. They have the adaptogenic 
uh, properties to them. But now we have research that shows when you put these mushrooms and herbs together, that they become very synergistic and powerful. And that's how I was able to do things like keep, you know, Nina's cancer at bay for 26 months, you know, yes. as a geriatric Doberman pincher. So things like that, I've been able to see. What are things that you've been able to see by using food as medicine over the years? Like your Akitas, how, how did they do? You must've been able to go, yeah, well, look, I just fed them for how many years and look how great they're doing. Great question. Well, our Akitas both lived to be 17 years old. Awesome. Which is um, pretty old for, for uh, an Akita. And they yeah. were all, both raw fed their entire lives. Uh, we've had many, many dogs since. That was many years ago. And not just with our own dogs, but of course with the thousands of dogs that we feed. Uh, we're, we feel very privileged to be in this position of being what we call a solutions company because we are the people that that uh, pet parents find when they're desperate. Yep. And although we would love to be the people that uh, provide the puppy food that starts the dog right in in their youth, youth, people usually come to us when they're having a problem. And they have either been to the vet and not found an answer, or the vet has said to them, look, there's nothing more that I can do. And they go on the internet and they Google kidney disease or pancreatitis or cancer and what diet is best. And they come to us and they come to us very desperate and very confused. And fortunately, we have an amazing team here of nutritionists who people can call and at no charge speak to um, and get a plan, a journey. We try to teach them, here's what you need to do with the diet. And uh, fortunately, we've been very, very successful. I, I, I think probably our number one success is with kidney disease. Um, somehow we became known as the company, the go-to company for kidney disease, but we have a protocol that has been really quite extraordinary in that we've seen dogs that have been written off by their veterinarians. You, you can never change this. You can never correct. You can never correct kidney disease. Once it's there, it's always going to be there. It's just not the case. You know, right. We've seen dogs that are in stage four kidney end up with perfect numbers over a period of time following the protocol that we use. Well, I would imagine just stop feeding that dog kibble would make a huge difference. And then to actually feed them something that's going to nourish them and help them heal and repair their kidney must be amazing. Exactly. Um, what Are there any vegetables that we shouldn't give their, our dogs? The only thing that we really stay away from are tomatoes, but we like fruits and vegetables, by the way. We love berries. We think berries can be very, very healing. Blueberries, cranberries, uh, raspberries, apples, um, and all of them can be fed not just in our foods, but uh, you know, as a treat if your dogs like them. Not all, not all dogs love them raw, but they usually like them when they're in, in the mix. So if you mix them in with bone broth or um, with with raw meat or even lightly cooked meat, um, most dogs will will end up loving it. You know, so that's that's a good thing. Yeah, nothing that we really feel you should totally stay away from. Even Brussels sprouts, some dogs like. I mean, some of them. It really, you know, look, dogs are all individuals, just like people. Yeah. Not everything is going to agree with every dog, and it is a little bit of trial and error with your own uh, with your own companion. You have to try things and see what works and uh, what makes them happy and what ha works with their digestion. Sometimes you can get a situation where a vegetable may cause some kind of distress. So um, we also recommend using them with probiotics and w we love our uh, Runs Be Done product, which- Oh my gosh, I swear by Runs Be Done. <laughs> we love Runs Be Done too, and it's great. And, and we also recommend using Runs Be Done when you're transitioning from kibble to a raw diet to make a smooth uh, trans transition. But um, look, we, we see everything from chronic diarrhea to cancer, from skin issues to pancreatitis. Uh, and we see and we know that by changing the diet, you are going to make the most significant change that you can possibly make in your dog's life. It's not a difficult thing to do. It can be daunting in the beginning, but once you know how to do it, 
you will never go back to feeding in any other way. No, you won't. I agree. Are there some vegetables that it's important, um, like for instance, mushrooms we know are bioaccumulators, like hemp is, meaning they must, they have to be grown organic. Does that take place for any other vegetables that we need to make sure that they are organic? Like for instance, I follow the EWG.org, the Environmental Working Group, and I know they have a dirty dozen yeah. list that they put out every year that goes, okay, avoid these because of the how bad the pesticides and everything that they're putting on these fruits and vegetables. Are there any that you say, absolutely, you should do it besides mushrooms? We're very uh, conscious of that. And unfortunately, it's not just what's being used as as being sprayed on, but it's what's in our earth. Right. It's what's in the ground. And it's, it's so many, very... so many of our fruits and vegetables are have do not have the vitamins and minerals that they had because they're not being grown in a rich soil. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. And it's also what's in our water. So if you're watering these vegetables with uh, tainted water, you're also going to have an issue. I, I think it's impossible, even if they're organic, to be completely pesti pesticide free. And it's very sad. I mean, that's sad for humans. It's sad for dogs. Uh, but we do our best, you know, where we we vet our uh, ingredient suppliers to a point that we know exactly how things are being grown. We know what's being used. We know how things are being freeze dried and dehydrated. Uh, we've been to all of their facilities so that we we actually have our own eyes on it. Um, we're making the food, as I showed you right here in our own facility. So we have hands on. We are looking at these ingredients. We're touching these ingredients. We're smelling these ingredients every day. So it's a critical part of our process. I don't want to talk about how important it is that you are making your own food in your own um, facility. Explain that because I, I mean, I learned it, but I don't think people understand that. <laughs> I, I love comparing what the industry I am in, which is the supplemental hemp um, fungi industry and comparing food because there's so many, there's so many ways that they are the same. Um, but uh, talk about that a little bit. So we've always made our, uh, our foods in-house. And uh, as you're well aware, manufacturing in the United States is not an easy task. Most pet food companies are marketing companies. Yep. They, um, they market their products and they have someone else make it. And, you know, that can or cannot be a good or a bad thing. You know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just we like to have the control. We so like why. <laughs> <laughs> we want to see everything being done in our own facility. We watch it. We see it. We taste it. We feel it. Look, we're feeding our own dogs this food. Yeah, we want to make sure that um, that we're doing everything we possibly can to make it pure. It would have been easier years ago to say this is too much for us because manufacturing is difficult. Mm -hmm. um, look, during the pandemic, we didn't close for one day, and asking people to come in and make this food every single day during the pandemic was not an easy task. Right. And we managed. We did it. So for two years, we remained open. We put protocols into place to keep people healthy. And we continued to produce the food because we knew that people were counting on us for their food. Uh, so it's always been very, very important for us to be hands on in the process of making the products ourselves. Uh, we have we used to do everything by hand, literally by hand, mixing it in 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 by hand and awesome. everything was done. Now we, of course, have to produce a whole lot more. So um, we do have machinery, but it's all run by people and it's all uh, done in a still a fairly manual process. Uh, but all of the ingredients are here within our own facility. Um, even our, our customer service department is right here in this facility. Awesome. So, I mentioned to you earlier that we moved to a larger facility about six months ago, which enabled us to produce much more, but still under our very uh, close, closely watched, careful procedural process. 
Um, I'm sure you've uh, heard about the Guinness Book World Records oldest dog, Bobby, at 31 years of age. Um, and I don't know if you heard what he ate every day. Um, did you hear what he ate? I didn't hear precisely. I know that he was fed ho homemade food, but right. So I it's funny because it. at the moment we hear 31, we go, "Yep, he was eating real food." We know we could have bet a million dollars that that dog was fed fed real food, and sure enough, he was fed whatever his family was eating from their own garden that they grew or what they could locally, you know, source right there. But he was fed real food his whole life. Um, when I was looking that up, I was looking at other you know, dogs, the oldest living dogs. And I think it's the third livest, longest living one was a border collie who lived to be 27 and was a vegetarian. Wow. So I wanted to talk about, which of course is just sent me down another black hole, but I want to talk about evolution because I think it's important um, when we talk about our dogs and feeding them an appropriate diet um, I think that the most important thing is that it's real food and that it's fresh food, that it is grown in a way that has its you know, nutrients, meaning it's grown in the, in the sunshine if that's where it's supposed to grow or in the woods on a piece of wood or whatever it is that it's grown the way it should be. Um, do you think the dogs have evolved to be able to handle more vegetables? Uh, because, of course, what I read is just like, us, where we used to be hunters and gatherers, and we didn't necessarily make as many of those um, digestive enzymes. And now that we don't and we grow our food, we create more digestive enzymes to help us digest that food. Do you think the same thing is happening with dogs? Because when I look at a Shih Tzu, <laughs> like that is so far from a wolf. And, um, and I know every dog is an individual, but I want to talk about evolution and how they've changed and how we've changed as our diet and what we are able to eat are. And doesn't that blow your mind that a vegetarian dog lived for 27 years? And it's a Guinness Book of World Records, just like the, the Bobby was. It does kind of blow my they mind. They had like three or four other dogs and they had another one that lived to 19 and another one at 20 and... Whatever. So it was the, the whole diet was that way. Well, one of my favorite stories was when people call us and they say, I, I only feed dog food. I, I never give them any table scraps. And they're very proud. No, I know. Right. <clears throat> and we always say, you know, well, if it's good enough for you to eat, why isn't it good enough for your dog to eat? And then the light bulb kind of goes off. Uh, or those along. marketing or those marketing companies that brainwash Absolutely. us to think that we have to feed a dog out of a box, out of a bag, and that it has to be kibble. It can only be dog food because that's the perfect food. And, you know, I wanted to mention because we also make bird food. Um, I know. <laughs> that uh, that it, it, it very similar thing happened with bird food that uh, in the late 80s, they came out with bird pellets that were similar to kibble for birds, where they said everything you need for nutrition for a bird is in this little pellet. And that became very popular. It was really a big trend for a long time. But birds are very picky in terms of texture and uh, flavor, and they like a lot of variety, unlike dogs. And they became very ill on these pellets, and dogs, the uh, birds were getting sick. So we are one of the few companies that still makes a very complete diet for all, all types of caged birds. We are not big fans of caged birds, I will say. Me neither. <laughs> it's so hard. <laughs> but if they're going to be in existence, we want to feed them right. And so we do make a complete line that is a, a huge variety of nuts and seeds and, and vegetables and fruits and all the things that they would find in the wild. So I just wanted to bring up that we don't just feed dogs. I do. I have your bird food and I love it. It's beautiful. And I agree. I rescue lots of birds and it's hard. I cannot put them in a cage. I'll have them, you know, a lot of times it's a rehab situation or raising a baby that fell out of a nest and they live on my back porch and fly around until they're ready to go. My most yeah. recent rescue was a one footed uh, racing pigeon that Aww. just ended up and stayed with us for a year. And honestly, I think 
he she recovered and went back home because we had a we had a day. We had a rescued pigeon for a while too. Dr. Harvey actually rescued the pige- pigeon. We also had a uh, a rescued uh, sun conure that we oh, found, wow. and um, we all, I, I was going to write a children's book about the sun conure that got rescued and lived in a bird food factory. <laughs> I love it. That's so funny. Uh, well, I um I enjoyed our conversation so much, and I'm sure other people will do. Where can people find out more information about you and Dr. Harvey's? I think the best place to start is at our website, which is drharvey's.com. And we have a very um, interesting blog that talks about all of the people who work here, as well as many of the things that are part of our mission. Uh, the website is filled with educational material. We really do see ourselves as educators. We really have been always at the forefront of teaching people there is a better way to keep your animals healthy. And uh, so I think the website is definitely the place to go. Well, thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise in creating such an incredible product for our pets. We really, truly appreciate it. And it's the best. And I really do. I'm, I'm so excited that this is something that's out there, that we have a choice. And it's an easy choice for someone who is, it, it makes it simple. You've got everything you need in the base, and then you can add whatever you want for the protein and oil. Thank you for doing that. And I love it because it came out of your own experience. And that's, your, that's literally what I did. You know, where I'm like, Great. here's the need, can't find it, let's create the best. So thank you so much, Wendy, for joining us today. My really great pleasure, it. Angela. Thank you so much for having me. You bet.